Hey, good morning, River Valley. How are you guys doing today? Perfect. Who said perfect over here? Awesome. That's it's hard to get better than that. We uh, have a couple things we want to highlight um, in your folder. We have um, probably the biggest reminder is the Easter service is coming up in two weeks. Hard to believe. It's here. Two weeks from uh, this weekend, and we'll have five service times uh, Saturday at 5 and 6.30 p.m., and then Sunday uh, at 8.50, 10, 10, and 11.30. And if you missed last week, we're actually changing to these service times permanently starting on Easter. So really the only effect for you guys, 10 minutes earlier, and uh, you guys can handle that, right? Or Saturday night, you can please help us with that because obviously we're going to be looking for some folks to be uh, helping us dis distribute uh, the crowd a little more evenly by helping us with one of those two Saturday services. That would be awesome. And then uh, we put in your folder this week a couple of invite cards for Easter weekend. Please um, uh, hand these out to folks, neighbors, friends, people you work with as a uh, convenient uh, invite. So many people will come on Easter weekend if asked, if invited. So I want to encourage you to do that. It's going to be a great weekend. We're going to have baptism uh, available. Of course, the gospel preached, uh, Christ honored, and, um, and a good opportunity if you have not been baptized or if you have someone that you know who you think that's the right time for them, talk to them about it, someone in your family. If it's a child, we encourage you to hook them up with one of our children's staff so they can understand what uh, baptism is all about. Uh, along with you to talk with them about that. And we have some baptism information at the uh, information table out there you could take with you. Uh, so big weekend, looking forward to that. That's when the new service times begin uh, on Easter weekend. We also have uh, the need for some children's ministry help uh, because we are adding a children's ministry uh, hour at that Saturday service. So the convenient thing about that is you can serve at one of the hours and then go to church the next. And so I uh, want to have you take a look at that. It says that they need some, some actors for Calico Street. There's a bunch of characters in here. So uh, I was thinking that would be really appropriate, right? Also, a bunch of eggs that are needed for the, um, the famous great egg hunt outreach. So if you could help with that. Someone here said, I'm giving 50 dozen. Oh, way to go, man. We still need your help, okay? We, oh, one more thing. A um, friend of mine, Bill Muir, film writer, um, producer, director, uh, has uh, a movie out called The Great Medallion, The Lost Medallion, The Lost Medallion, showing at um, Southgate. And it's a family-friendly, uh, good message, good theme kind of a movie. This is the kind of movies we're trying to get out, but don't always get out, you know, because you know how the money works and the support. So the, the more support this weekend, the better, the longer it'll be at Southgate. Bill Muir, formerly Vice President of Youth for Christ, he's preached here in the church, and we really, he lives here in the Rogue Valley, good guy. Um, so uh, if, man, if you got nothing to do this afternoon, go catch the Lost Medallion. It's especially good for kids junior high and younger. Um, and uh, so... There you go. If that works for you, take the grandkids, take the kids, take your husband who can act like a kid at times, whatever, uh, to the lost medallion. We are in a series called Intentional, uh, getting a purpose for our lives, getting a purpose for our church, the mission for our church. Our purpose is to connect, grow, and go. That's a good individual purpose statement also because if we're not connected to Christ, if we're not connected with each other as the body of Christ, then we don't... Uh, have the foundation. We don't have the starting point. So we've been talking about connecting. We've been talking about growing and then going, which is a life of service. Wherever we are, we're, we're serving and we're discipling others. Uh, we've been focusing especially on connect uh, because that is the right and critical start, just like a child has to be born, right, in order to have a life. Okay, so you have to have spiritual birth. That's a new Christian. And growing as a child in the faith, it's a great start. Um, but we don't want to stay spiritual children forever. It's kind of illustrated in this video here that I want to show you um, about uh, kindergarten. Take a look, th look at this. I think you'll uh, get the point. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? 
Why not move on? And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America and to the Republic. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house! Well, I'm just very successful here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? B. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. It's really good. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still, still hungry. hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? No, nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes wonder why to. That was not a good choice. I'm very disappointed. Okay, so kindergarten's great, but not when you're 38. You know what I'm saying? And just like that's totally unacceptable, we like laugh at it, and it's like crazy, but we do that spiritually. We stay like in kindergarten spiritually. We don't, we don't grow up. So we have to take this seriously. We're serious as a church about being a disciple and making disciples. We care about one another too much to just say, oh, yeah, I just kind of stay as kindergartner spiritually. So we're talking about growing. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to look at one of the greatest passages on growth, John 15. I invite you to turn there, John 15, if you're not there uh, yet. And let me set the stage. If you're using the Bible in your book pocket there, it's about page six or 762 right in there, 762. There's a couple different, ver couple, couple different versions there, but it's, that'll get you close, John 15. Um, Jesus is, is his last night before he dies, and he's having a meal with his disciples. Now, this crew, this is not like some impressive group of men. This is more like a motley crew. This is more like a ragtag group that Jesus could see deeper, and he could see what they would accomplish through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's hanging out with these guys. He's doing a lot of teaching there on the last night, and they have a meal together. We call this the Last Supper, and they're in this room called the Upper Room, and um, that's where Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and a bunch of teaching went on there, but then they left, and I've actually been on the path that they walked. It's pretty cool, where they went across uh, the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives, uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane, which is right at the base of the Mount of Olives. It's just right across from the eastern wall of Jerusalem. You just see the wall there, the temple. You can see the valley, and then the, the Mount of Olives across in the Garden of Gethsemane at the bottom. And so as Jesus is walking along, there would have been vineyards right there in the middle. And not only that, on the huge temple, Herod's temple, magnificent building, uh, there would have been a golden vine, big golden vine over the doors that, that they could see. So Jesus stops and he gives a lesson on location. He liked to do this. When you read the Bible and you see what he's teaching about, if you really dig in, you see he's on a location where he's taking the moment. and It'd be a good thing to do as parents. Teach about the Lord on location where you are, taking lessons and as grandparents uh, also. So Jesus is there. There's vineyards. And he starts teaching about uh, the vine. And the first thing he says here, he says, he says, I am the true vine. It's a great statement. He's saying, I'm the guy. Israel was known as being a vine, uh, but, but Jesus is like, no, I'm the true vine. It's not a king. It's not a nation. It's not religion. It's me. It's a, it's a, relation, a personal relationship, uh, a living uh, relationship with, with me, the vine. And uh, this is just one of the many I am statements that Jesus made. He uh, talked about, you know, I am the bread of life. Cool statements. I'm living water. I'm the good shepherd, I'm the door, um, you know, on and on, a lot of these I am statements. And, and the phraseology is um, him claiming to be God. That's the I am name for God. So, I mean, he's saying, you want to know God, you want to know the Father, follow me. Look 
at me. I am Yahweh, or Hayah is, is the, the name. He then gives this story, a parable, allegory of the vine. Let me read it to you, the first 11 verses. Follow along. He says, I'm the true vine, and my father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Okay, let's unpack it. The characters here, first, you have Jesus who's the vine, okay? Uh, we've got a little visual over here. Jesus is the vine. This is where all the action is. And, and then you have the Father, God the Father, who's the gardener. And, and then you have the uh, branches, and that's us. That's all people. All people are branches. There's two kinds of branches. There are those in Christ who are Christians, and those branches that are not in Christ who are not uh, Christians. And then you have fruit, and fruit is what God's wanting to accomplish through our lives. And there's, there's two very important kinds of fruit, inward and outward. Inward fruit, that's the fruit of the Spirit. And I, I'm like, I've got to get me more of this. The fruit of the Spirit comes by the Holy Spirit. This stuff is priceless, man. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that right there changed the world. Because that's the fruit of the Spirit. Inward fruit that then leads to outward fruit. How we talk, how we act, our service, our works, our witnessing, those kinds of things. Now what does God want? What's the goal? Okay, what's the win? Well, it's fruit. He says in verse 8, he says, By this is my Father glorified, that you bear fruit. That's, that's what it's about, bearing fruit. Okay, that's what gives God great glory. And it gives us great purpose. So... Um, the good news and the big idea here today, what we need to talk about, is that uh, we can bear much fruit if we just realize what God is up to and respond. Respond appropriately. I think so much of our Christian walk, we miss what God's doing and we put it all on ourselves. It all should be an overflow of what God's doing and just responding to Him and His leadership and His great work as God in our lives. So let's look at what God's doing first. He places us in the vine. Verse 6, if anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So God places us in the vine. It's called grafted in. You who garden, you kind of you know these things. I've never done that, but you can graft a branch in. That's the idea. We've been placed into the vine, placed into Jesus. We become a Christian. And, uh, and the person that's not in the vine, this is talking about the person that's not in the vine, and that's a branch that's dead. It's not bearing any fruit, there's no life, and there's no leaves, and it's, it's tragic. Someone could say, well, uh, I, I'm not sure I want Jesus in my life. I'm not sure I want to be in the vine. I don't want to be a Christian. And you have that choice. You have that opportunity. But, but, it's, but it's tragic, man. It's a, it's a tragedy to not come to Christ because, first of all, your life has no purpose. You're a dead branch. There's no fruit. There, no nothing spiritually taking place. It's tragic. It doesn't have to be. You can get in the vine. You can become a believer. The second reason it's, it's a tragedy, even worse, is your future, man, separated from God and thrown into the fire and burned. And the image, imagery here would be, of course, judgment uh, separated from a holy God forever and ever in hell. And so, I mean, God doesn't want that. We don't want that. I don't think you want that. And so get into the uh, vine. That's what he's talking about here. Now, the second uh, thing that God is doing, and, and these points two through four are talking about the Christian, is he's wanting us to, you know, move on up, 
from a life of no fruit to fruit, okay? Lots of fruit. Helping people, discipling people, your life overflowing onto them. The fruit's not just for you. It's not especially for you. It's for others to pick and to be blessed. Um, so uh, what, what he's doing is, first of all, in verse 2 it says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. It's a very difficult, controversial passage because some take this to mean that if you don't bear fruit, then God cuts you off and then throws you into hell. And there are some churches, works-based, legalistic churches, that love this teaching because they keep everybody busy. Now, the problem with this uh, particular interpretation is that there's too many verses that teach that once we come to Christ, it's permanent that we are sealed in the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13, that, that, that no one can snatch us out of God's hands, John chapter 10. And so I don't think this is talking about a Christian, oh, you're not bearing any fruit anymore, you're cut off, you're thrown into hell. That's not ta- I don't think it's talking about that. Others say, oh, okay, this is talking about someone who never was a Christian. That's why he gets cut off and thrown away. But the problem is, they're in the vine. So that would be, I, I believe, a picture that someone's a Christian and not someone who never was a Christian. You say, well, like, well, what does this mean? Well, let me talk about the Greek word for just a second. I, I usually don't like pummel you with a bunch of Greek stuff, but I think it's very important at times. And this Greek word is arrow. Now, the New Testament, as you know, is written in Greek, and sometimes it's very important for us to understand what the word's talking about because our English struggles. Whenever you translate something, and I want you to have great confidence in your Bible, by the way, but there are times it's like there's a struggle. It's like our English. Sometimes a word will have a couple different meanings, and based on the context is how you apply it. So same thing here with this word arrow. It can mean take away or cut off, as it's translated here, or it could also mean lift up. 23 times the words used in John alone, 13 times to take away or to cut off, and eight times to uh, lift up. I think you would agree that these are two different meanings. It's like, let's say you're riding your bike and you make a stupid move and you fall over. So like, I can come up, get out of my car, and help lift you up and get you back going. Or I can decide to run you over and throw you away. (laughs) Big difference, right? (laughs) Big difference. Well, I I think in the context here, it could be translated either way because of the gardening illustration, but but in the heart of of the the text, I believe that Jesus has in mind lifting a person up. I think this is a Christian who's going through a season of their life, a really hard season, and it's like this branch that's down here, and you can't, I don't know if you can see it, but it's in the dirt, it's in the mud, but it's a branch, it's connected to the vine, and so I believe this is the work of our God to get us bearing fruit where he will pick us up, lift us up, which I believe is the better translation, and wash us off and get us detached to the trellis so that we can be bearing fruit. Now, I know some of you, you know, you get this because you garden, you, your tomatoes are laying down, you, know, you clean it, you say, it's, that's a good branch, you clean it off, you lift it up. That's, you know, that's the idea. Now, uh, people might object, and they, I know some of you might say, and I respect this view, This can't be a Christian because Christians bear fruit. All Christians bear fruit. And I believe that. I believe the Bible teaches that all Christians bear fruit. But what this is, this is a short-term season where there's no fruit. And this, I love this, God's commitment to get a true Christian bearing fruit. You guys follow me? Now, if this thing's laying down there forever, over the long haul, that's an indication that it's not connected to the vine. It's dead, okay? Because there's no such thing as a no-fruit Christian over the long haul, all right? That, that you, you see, it might look connected, but it's not connected. It's like I talked about in the previous point. It's a dead branch. But there are times we go through seasons, usually because of sin in our life, sometimes maybe because of times of healing where we've gone through a serious uh, woundedness, and we're dealing with some issues in our, in our past or whatever. We need to get help. We need to get counseling. We need to get support. And it's God's way of lifting us back up and getting us, you know, producing fruit. But most often, there's sin in our lives. And there's a bunch of mud and a bunch of junk and dirt, and that's why we're laying around there. And so God's commitment is to discipline us. 
It's a good discipline. It's a good hurt. Hebrews 12 talks about this. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline, it says, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son and daughter. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while because they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So talking about God's discipline, because he's a perfect, loving father, and he will bring hardship and difficulties and rebuke and correction in our lives. Now, you guys know this. This typically goes from soft to loud. It's like as a parent, we typically discipline from soft to loud. It's like it sort of starts with the verbal rebuke, right? You read the scriptures. You say, don't do this. Turn, go the other direction, right? Sometimes that, that verbal gets louder, and, and maybe it's a preacher, and it de- de- depends on how loud he yells, right? And it's getting louder. And then sometimes it's someone in your life who loves you enough to actually pull you aside and to talk to you about what they're seeing, you know? Oh, they don't love me. They're, they're being mean. Well, maybe they're just being really loving to tell you straight out something that needs to be adjusted, something needs to be changed. That's how God starts, and God would say, man, repent. Deal with that because it goes from soft to loud. But then if we don't repent, God has to bring out more of the, you know, the power tools, right? It's like dealing with like a diamond and, 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 and dealing with the rough edges, and we got a lot of rough edges, don't we? All right, shake your head. Yeah. <laughs> and so God starts with the fine sandpaper, and if we don't let that do the job, then he gets some more gritty sandpaper, ouch, if that doesn't work, then he's got the hammer and chisel. And if that doesn't work, and we're, we're, we're thick-headed, rebellious, power tools, right? Jackhammer, dynamite, whatever it takes. And it's tragic, because we've seen this happen in our lives. It's like, why didn't I get this? I didn't have to go this far down the road. Why? And we even more frustrate other people's lives, because we can't like make them change. And it's like, man, if we just realize that God's just trying to uh, get our attention and to cause us to uh, repent so that we, we get into a place where, where there's, there's fruit in our lives. Now, the, the third thing that God's trying to do is he's trying to take us from a place of fruit to more fruit. Okay, this is good. This is better. Okay? This is like kindergarten, first grade. This is, you know, more like junior high, high school spiritually. Okay? So getting us, you know, growing bearing fruit. Verse 2 says, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. All right, now, this doesn't make any sense. It's like, wait a minute, you got a perfectly good branch, it's green, there's leaves, it's growing fruit, and you prune it? That's crazy. What are you talking about? Well, you who garden, you know how important this is. You have to decide, do you want leaves or fruit? It's a lot easier to grow leaves, isn't it? I'm great at growing leaves. You just see all the leaves in my garden. It's like, where's the fruit, man? (laughs) Well, you got to get out there and you got to do some pruning, don't you? At a certain time of the year, and God the Father, he comes out, he starts pruning us. Why? Because there's so much that's competing with the real fruit bearing in our lives. For a lot of us, it's busyness, man, just running around, shaking with our head cut off, trying to accomplish everything, thinking they've got to be everywhere. And it's like God's wanting to like, no, no, let's, let's cut some stuff back. We got to get light. A gardener knows we got to get light on the vine. And, and when there's all this stuff going on, we can look real good on the outside, but, but the closer look, there's really not the fruit. Now, we can work with the Lord on this before he gets out the loppers. We can actually do that to ourselves. And that's a good thing where you take some time, say, God, if I'm going to add these three things to my schedule, which I know you want me to, I've got to take away some stuff, all right? Unless you've got all kinds of time, you're just laying around. You probably have to take away some stuff and prune. But maybe we don't prune because it's an identity thing. It makes us feel so good about us, or it's just an idol in our lives, or I mean, and the list goes on and on why we don't prune. But we need to cut that back, or at least, you know, Allow the Lord to cut that back and respond to him. I, I won't name any names, but in our home group, all kinds of hurts and, and uh, things people are going through, and yet to a person, they're all saying, 
glad we're going through this. I'm glad God's bringing this in my life. It's helping me trust him. It's helping me grow. It's keeping me up nights, but that's led to prayer. You know, so it's, it's good. You know, it's really good. We're not excited about the pain, but glad about what God is teaching us in the pruning. Now, the fourth thing, of course, like I shared earlier, that God's trying to do is he's trying to take us from more fruit to much fruit for God's glory. And uh, in order for us to live this way, again, we need to back up, and we have to understand what God's up to, and then we need to respond appropriately. What God is up to, let me review. First, God the Father, the gardener. God's doing all the heavy lifting. He's doing the hard work. He's the one down there on his knees, and he's lifting us up out of the dirt, not disgusted, not you're such a loser, but he loves you. He cares for you, washing you off, getting you back up, seeing the potential for your life, right? That's our great God, cultivating the ground, pruning away the branches, Okay, it's like I was out in my garden recently, and I don't really know what the heck I'm doing, but I, was, I just know I'm supposed to cut the vines back, all right? So I would much rather would have been in watching TV sucking on some iced tea or something. But you got to get out there and do the work. Our God is doing the work, cutting us back, knowing what it takes in our lives to produce fruit. That's our God, the great Father, our gardener, all right? Man, I love that about him. Jesus, the Son of God, is the vine. He's the whole deal, man. He's the one going down into the soil, getting the nutrients so that we have any hope. And then who's the Holy Spirit? The sap. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, getting the sap flowing through us so that fruit is being uh, naturally produced in our lives. Never heard about or seen a branch going, fruit, fruit, fruit. I mean, the branch doesn't try to bear fruit. The branch just needs to stay connected. And that's our response. Our response to what this great God has done for us. Man, first of all, he's gotten us into the vine. They all work together. The Holy Spirit pointing us to the vine. You say, he said, he's the guy. You need Jesus. Don't settle for religion. Don't settle for moralism. You need Jesus. The Holy Spirit, that's why you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian yet, it's not me talking to you. It's the Holy Spirit saying, you need Jesus. You need to get in the vine. And then Jesus, once you get saved, Jesus is saying, hey, what this is all about is the glory of the Father, that God looks good, that God is pleased by our lives, that we're bearing fruit. So what's our response? We read it 10 times in this passage to abide, to remain. Your Bible might say abide. We don't use that word much in the English today. It just means to remain. The idea there is that, that well, let, let's look at it. I mean, you got verse 4, remain in me and I'll remain in you. You must remain in the vine. Verse 5, if a man remains in me and I in him, he'll bear much fruit. Verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. Verse 9, now remain in my love. Verse 10, if you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. I mean, it just goes on and on talking about remaining. And I love this here. This is talking about how simple it is to just be a branch. Man, I, I tell you, I love what I do. I love to be able to talk to you about just being a branch and let God do his work in you. And a gardener knows that the most important thing is that there be a big connection where the branch goes into the vine. And if there's a big connection there, everything else is just natural, man. Sap of the Holy Spirit's going to be flowing. It'll be natural in our lives. It's not so much doing more for the Lord. It's being more connected to the Lord. And then we will do more naturally for him. He talks about here how the words remaining in us and then through prayer we'll, we'll get what we ask for. And the idea there is it's not so much being in the word as important as that is, but it's his word in us. And it's that natural, you know, talking and communicating with God. That's our number one priority. And not like a checkoff, like, oh, you know, we punched a time card in heaven, spent time with God today, done that, checked off the box in the Bible reading journal, Mark said, you know, not that. Okay, that's just a tool. We're talking about hanging with Jesus. 
We're talking about our life. Why settle for anything less? Like you get up, man, it's all about Jesus. This day's about Jesus. I'm not excited about some of the things on my to-do list, but it's all about Jesus today. And you get in the car and you're driving, and it's all about Jesus. I'm going to love him and talk to him and spend time with him and think about him and depend upon him and praise him. Like 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. That's my day-to-day for Jesus. I just want to live with you, talk to you. Just, it's not this religious separation. I did my religious thing. I, I was even real spiritual today. I got in the Word this morning. I prayed for three minutes. Like, it's continuing. It's just taking that. It's, it's a natural relationship with the Lord. Don't settle for anything less. Man, what an amazing thing to be able to just give thanks throughout the day. To, to be able to praise God for what's happened in the day, for who he is, and to be able to pray throughout the day, drawing upon his life. Like it says in Galatians 5, we walk with the Spirit. I like that picture. We're walking with the Lord. Just picturing him next to you. He's actually in you. Just picture, man, just walking. You could be living and doing and, and, do, and all the things. Are, you see, you, two people have the exact same day. One person can just be in the flow with the Lord, with purpose, with joy, with motivation, with fruit. The other Christian just kind of doing their thing, punching the clock, running errands. We just, we just need to remain in him. That's what it's about. And it says here, if we remain in his love, that's a huge, just remain under his love to be led by the Spirit. And, and then it says, if you obey my commands, you remain in my love. I'm glad he says that because this isn't like, hey, I'm hanging with you, Jesus. Oh, you want me to go this way? I'll catch you later. I'm going to go my way. That's stupid. Why would we do that? Like, we think we know better. Anything Jesus tells us to do is best for us. And so we're walking with him, and it's that relationship throughout the day, and it's alive. It's, he's a living God. He's not just words on a page. And he says, look, this is, this is where you need to be with your finances. This is where you need to be with your dating. This is where you need to be in your attitude at work. Okay, well, I'm going to kind of go over here. Don't do that, man. Because then your, your, your connection starts to get really small on the vine. Don't make it that. It's a relationship with the living God where we can depend upon him and we can trust the sap of the Holy Spirit. I'm serious. It's like me here teaching you. I'm always tempted to think, well, it's got to be something I'm going to say or something I'm going to, you know, uncover that's going to bring change to your life. That's hogwash. There's nothing I can say to change your life. It'll be me trusting the Holy Spirit to do that. It's the Spirit of God in me who connects with the living Spirit, Jesus, in you to bring that change through the power of his word. That's, that's going to be that I, I trust him completely, and that's how we need to be living. It's like I'm depending on Jesus. It's going to be him. And I want to ask you two questions, and we'll be done. I was reading in Deuteronomy 6, just in my own time with the Lord, where it's talking about, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and then you take his commands, and like you, you write them on your hand, and you put them on your forehead, and you put them on the wall of your house. And, and uh, uh, you talk about them when you're sitting around the house, and you talk about them when you lay, you know what I'm talking about, that passage? You talk about them when you get up. It's kind of a lifestyle. And the Lord spoke to me. He's like, two things. First, how often do we really think about Jesus during our day? Like, do we have these big gaps, you know, hours and hours? I know life can get busy, work can get to be the grind and all that, but, but it doesn't have to, we don't have to leave Jesus behind. He can be right there in the midst of it. It's like Roger said a couple weeks ago, weeks ago, God on the brain, you know, God on the brain, just like all throughout the day. So that's the first question. How are we thinking about him? The second question is, how naturally do we talk about him? Or do we consider our faith a private matter? Oh, this is just my thing. And we see, if, if, so, if it's really natural, if it's fresh, it's alive, he's alive, it'll be more natural just to be sharing with others and be talking naturally to, and I'm not saying that this is maybe something that you have a lot of history with, you feel real good about, but it will, you will grow in naturally talking about the Lord there with your family and with your home group, because it's not just going to be just a church religious thing. 
It's going to be something, he's going to be real. He's going to be fresh. He's going to be someone you want to talk about and let people know what's happening in your life. If that's not where you're at, then I want to encourage you, get a bigger connection with the vine. Get a more living, fresh, active, real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what I'm after, guys. That's what I want. I hope that's what you want. I'm not here to tell you to do anything today other than just get a big connection with Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much for the great God that you are. All that you have done for us to get us into the vine. I pray if there's anybody here today that's not in the vine, that's not saved, that they would talk to somebody today about how to know you, how to be forgiven of their sin, and how to get connected to you, Jesus. Lord, I, I, I want to pray for all of us who already are connected, God, that we would see this relationship with you for what it really is. What a great vine you are. What an awesome Holy Spirit you are. And to give us the nutrients and the sap. Lord, bear fruit in and through us, God. And we may not like the pruning and some of the cutbacks, God, but we know that you're smart, that you have a work that you're doing. And I pray that we would allow you to do that and work with you, God. Because we want to bear more fruit because this gives you great glory. And as your scripture says, it gives us great joy. And so, God, deepen us in you, widen our connection into you, that it would be living, alive, fresh, because that's who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name. is to your name, O oh Lord.